Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome everyone, this is lecture 5 and the last part of an overview of microbial life. Um, as I mentioned in the previous slide, uh, we have already covered the classification of uh, living organisms, uh, prokaryotes and eukaryotes and different microbial groups. In this particular lecture, we are going to be looking at prokaryotic diversity and the microbial genome. Um, so, I think I mentioned at some point that uh, we have three domains, we have bacteria, we have archaea and eukarya. Now eukarya means all eukaryotes and all prokaryotes are divided into two domains, bacteria and archaea. So I also mentioned I think at some point that archaea are bacteria that perhaps uh, started life in a environment that is nothing like what we see uh, today. So remember that life did not begin under uh, conditions that we see today. Life began under very, very harsh conditions. Uh, the temperature was very high, pH was somewhat low, there was no oxygen in those conditions. Those are the conditions under which life began. So these archaeobacteria are considered to be extremophiles and that's what we're going to look at in this particular slide. So here we have a few examples of archaeobacteria and just one example of a more modern bacteria or a eubacteria or just bacteria. So let's take the idea of temperature first. Uh, we will be looking at these uh, factors in more detail in subsequent topics, but this is just to give you a little bit of an idea about extremophiles. These are a very interesting group of bacteria, so that's why uh, it's important to at least recognize the fact that they exist and they exist in very, very harsh conditions, which we would normally imagine no life can exist. So, at very high temperatures, we have a group of bacteria called hyperthermophilic bacteria or hyperthermophiles. Uh, they are capable of living from uh, living within a temperature range of 106 to 113 degree centigrade. Their habitat can be hot water springs or boiling water springs. They can be in submarine hydrothermal vents. So you have hot gases coming out from the um, depth of the earth in these um, marine environments at the depth of the ocean floor and so on. These are archaeobacteria. So this is uh, one particular example called pyrolobus fumarae. At the other end of the temperature range, we have what are called psychrophilic bacteria. These psychrophilic bacteria are capable of thriving under uh, sub-zero conditions. So we have one particular species, Synecococcus lividus, which is capable of living even in ice. So people have bored into uh, Antarctic ice and found examples of algal as well as bacterial cells that have been able to thrive even under those conditions. Then we have low pH. Those are called acidophilic bacteria. Uh, they are in this particular example, it's a volcanic spring, but you can see acidophilic bacteria and acid mine drainage. Uh, the limits in terms of pH are negative uh, units of 0.06 all the way to pH 4. And these are again archaeobacteria. And in this particular example, it's uh, Picrophilus oshimae and high pH, which means base, they are thriving in a high pH environment. So it's an alkali file or an alkali fill, 8.5 to 12 pH. Soda lakes are examples of where you might find these bacteria. And these are again archaeobacteria. 
at the bottom of the ocean or in the depths of the oceans where the uh, pressure because of the hydrostatic pressure is extremely high uh, there are certain living there are very few living organisms that can withstand those kinds of hydrostatic pressures so the number of organisms you see in the depth of the oceans is much much less than what you see at the higher uh, layers or the high uh, yeah uh, so these barophilic bacteria they are capable of withstanding pressures of 500 to more than 1000 atmospheres and the Marianas Trench which is considered to be the deepest point um, on the planet there are bacteria that have been found even in that location it's again an archaeobacteria and it's been named for the location so it's called Mariana Trench MT41 you would think that salt which we think of as a preservative when we think about food preservation we think of high saline solutions as being preservatives because most bacteria or pathogenic bacteria are not capable of growing in them so that is definitely true however that does not mean there are no bacteria in the salt pans if you happen to go to a salt pan you might want to take a sample and see if there are bacteria in it because halophilic bacteria are capable of thriving even in those environments so they have uh, the ability to tolerate saline concentrations of 15 to 32 percent what is the saline concentration of seawater seawater is 3.5 5%. So, this is 10 times almost 10 times higher than seawater. So, even under those conditions, there are certain algal cells as well as bacteria that are capable of growing and surviving. So, this is an example of an archaeobacteria, it's a Halobacterium salinarum, and I'll show you some graphics which also give you examples of the same. So, here we have a boiling water spring. Uh, this is in the this is from the Yellowstone National Park all the colors are due to different species of thermophilic bacteria that live in this particular spring the blue water in the center is extremely hot it's boiling but it does not prevent particular species of bacteria from growing in it here's another example of a hyperthermophilic archaeobacteria it the optimum temperature for its growth is 100 degree centigrade. So, this is Pyrococcus furiosus. So, here we have hyperthermophilic bacteria. This is a um, SEM, this is a scanning electron micrograph. You can see it and you can see the size. It's a very small sized bacteria. These are um, this is an aquifex bacteria which has an optimum temperature of growth which is greater than 80 degree centigrade. You can see the tree of life just to remind you the phylogenetic tree and this is the last universal common ancestor and you have the two branches with the prokaryotes bacteria and archaea and eukarya which is the third branch or the third domain. Then we have another extremophile called uh, Deinococcus radiodurans and this is considered the world's toughest bacterium according to the Guinness Book of World Records. This bacterium has the ability to withstand radiation that no human being or any other organism is capable of withstanding. It can survive under extremely low temperature conditions and pH. It can live without water, without air and so on. So, these are examples of extreme uh, thermophiles or uh, extreme extremophiles. Then uh, like I said Halobacter salinarum this is an example of that uh, bacteria which is capable of growing in salt pans. Remember the concentration of salt in salt pans is much higher than, on, than in seawater. So even in marine seawater you will find that very few bacteria are capable of surviving. So, there are some species that are capable of surviving in these harsh environments. This particular graphic is of a uh, bacteria growing on salt saturated agar plates. Uh, you can find them in salted fish, you can find them in hides, uh, the animal hides, hypersaline lakes and salt pans and salt turns. This uh, graphic shows you uh, algal growth 
in ponds. So this is a red algae, uh, Duna liella salina, which has very high amounts of beta carotene and it's a halophile. So it is uh, red in color. That's in fact, uh, I should mention uh, one more point here that sometimes you can see a pinkish color where uh, you have high saline uh, solutions or high uh, saline containing wastewaters, you will find this pinkish color and that pinkish color may be due to either uh, the bacteria that are growing in these conditions or due to these red algal cells. So it depends on you have to test the sample for all these uh, possibilities. Uh, then you have, uh, like I said, radiation resistant um, extremophile, uh, extremophiles, thermococcus gamma tolerance. This is an extremophile. It's extremely resistant to radiation. It can withstand 30,000 grays in terms of gamma radiation. And for comparison, 5 grays is sufficient for killing a human being. So you can see that these bacteria, they're all archaeobacteria. And these archaeobacteria go back to a time when um, the conditions on the planet were extremely hostile compared to current conditions, but they are reminders of that past. Um, I've already explained this slide, but just to remind you that there is a lot of uh, prokaryotic diversity in so many different environments. So this is uh, what you might find in a wastewater sample. This is what you find on the surface of the human tongue. Uh, this is what you can see in marine environments. You take a sample from a pond, freshwater pond, you will again find it teeming with life. You will find algae, bacteria, protozoa, you name it, all these microorganisms show up under the microscope. Then you have uh, streptomyces. So this is a gram-positive bacteria, which is filamentous in nature. You can see how individual cells have formed these long filaments. They almost look like the fungi that we were looking at. And that's why the name streptomyces. It's filamentous, it's found in soil and mud. And um, most of us have experienced this earthy smell. So when you have dry soil becoming wet, there is a release of a particular compound which has this beautiful earthy smell that most of us like. And that is due to a particular compound called geosmin. And animals and human beings are very sensitive to the smell of geosmin because that was what helped us find water. So um, not only do we find it extremely pleasant, but it's also an indicator of the presence of water. Then we have gram-negative bacteria uh, like Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Now Pseudomonas aeruginosa, because it's gram-negative, it means it cannot retain the crystal violet stain. So we will talk about the gram staining procedure in uh, the microscopy uh, topic, but for now, it's just simple. Uh, it's enough for uh, me to say that for reasons of uh, the structure of the cell wall, gram-negative bacteria are not going to retain the first stain, which is the crystal violet stain, and the second stain, which is the counter stain, saffronin, gives it an orange color. So what you see over here is an orange color that is because the bacteria Pseudomonas aeruginosa is gram-negative. Uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa is all around us. It's present in soil, it's present in the feces of uh, human beings, animals, uh, perhaps even birds. Uh, it's similar to E. coli. E. coli is also another one that is found in the feces of humans and animals and birds and so on. So these are both gram-negative bacteria that are very common in our environment. You will find it in water, soil, um, all of these uh, environments, not in air. They need water. Yeah. Then we come to filamentous cyanobacteria. So we have two examples here, oscillatoria and spirulum. So cyanobacteria are, um, there was a point in time when they used to be called blue-green algae. 
but cyanobacteria are considered to be the ones that have modified the planet atmosphere from anoxic conditions to the present oxic condition. So, the oxygen in the atmosphere that we see today, it's a fairly high amount of oxygen, 29%, and that amount of oxygen has been created by these cyanobacteria. Without them, none of us would be here. And uh, they are also found in several different forms. They are found in unicellular forms, colonial forms, heterocystis forms. The heterocystis forms are the ones that are capable of fixing nitrogen from the atmosphere. Uh, remember that nitrogen gas that is present in the atmosphere, it's a huge amount, but it's not bioavailable. And unless you have bioavailable nitrogen, you cannot have productivity. Even plants, photosynthetic organisms need bioavailable nitrogen to survive and grow. So, all life on the planet literally depends on the presence and availability of bioavailable nitrogen. So, that too is um, part of, uh, is attributed to these cyanobacteria. We now come to another interesting aspect about uh, microorganisms and that is the genetic material. So, when we talk about the genetic material, the entirety of the genetic material of any organism is called its genome. So, you have heard about the human genome project. So, here we are going to restrict ourselves to uh, looking at the microbial genome and how does it compare to the genome of um, other uh, organisms. So, the entire DNA, which is the genome or the genome, whatever you want to call it, um, that is the entirety of the genetic material or the DNA. Here we have the entire DNA and now this DNA has different segments on it and you will find that if you look at any particular chromosome, you will find that there are segments that have information that is utilized by the organism to code for a particular protein. So, one segment, let us say if I were to, yeah, let me try and draw this. Okay, so a very rough sketch of what a particular chromosome might look like. So, you have a long strand of the DNA and you will have segments and each segment that encodes for one product or one protein is called a gene. So, every segment that encodes for one product by definition is called the gene. You will have strands that do not encode for anything. So, they are called the non nonsense uh, code and uh, so every and they are not equal in size you might have small genes and large ones and so on. So, uh, that is each gene is a segment of the DNA that encodes for one product and that product is generally a protein and this can be encoding the encoding remember I said this in a previous lecture that the DNA is uh, transcribed to the RNA and then the RNA is translated to a protein. So, those are the two processes that have to happen for the proteins to be formed. Um, so, this can happen via the messenger RNA or it can happen through another RNA or something like the ribosomal RNA. Now, for the prokaryotes, since we are going to be focusing more or less on prokaryotes, mostly on bacteria and uh, we know that these prokaryotes have a large single circular double stranded DNA that is one single chromosome. So, these prokaryotes do not have more than one chromosome, they have just one chromosome and it is a single circular chromosome and uh, they do not have a well defined nucleus, this single chromosome is scattered throughout the uh, cytoplasm of these uh, prokaryotes and uh, so eukaryotes have a linear DNA in the nucleus and because the nucleus is very well defined, the chromosomes whether they are a single chromosome or multiple chromosomes, they are packaged in a very organized state. 
Now, um, if there are two copies of the chromosome, it's called a diploid cell. If there is a single copy, it's called a haploid cell. Uh, for cell reproduction to happen, uh, the chromosomes have to be doubled and then the cell divides. So, for the new biomass to be generated, you need doubling of the chromosomes followed by cell division. In sexual reproduction, the diploid genetic material is first split into two haploid cells in a process called meiosis. Cell division is mitosis and the um, halving of the diploid cell is always, um, uh, ha it happens only in sexual reproduction and that happens by the process of meiosis. Um, then you have bacterial yeast, just an example, Saccharomyces uh, cerevisiae, which has 16 chromosomes, which means 8 pairs. The human cells have 46 chromosomes, which means 23 pairs. So, here are, uh, this is a graphic on the upper right, you can see a graphic that shows the uh, 23 pairs, yes, the 23 pairs of chromosomes that human beings uh, have and out of these 23, 22 are autosomes and there are only, there is only one pair of uh, sex chromosomes that is the ones that def uh, define the gender. So, XX uh, represents females and XY represents males. Uh, coming back to uh, the genome and the uh, terms that we use to uh, describe the genetic code. So, the genome means the entirety of the DNA. It has one or more chromosomes. So, a bacteria has only one chromosome. Uh, higher organisms will have more than one chromosome and each DNA molecule will have segments. I have already shown you that. So, it every single chromosome has several genes. It is not just one gene, every chromosome has several genes. These DNA segments on the chromosome are encoding for separate products. So, by definition, a gene is the that segment of the DNA that encodes for a particular product. And a gene can have millions of nucleotide base pairs or it may have a few hundred or few thousand base pairs. So, that is the uh, correspondence between gene to product to base pairs. I have already mentioned that bacteria have only one chromosome with about 3000 to 4000 genes. And uh, we know uh, that human beings have 23 pairs of chromosomes with the largest one having uh, 2968 genes and the smallest one, the Y chromosome has the fewest number of genes and that is 231 genes. Um, these prokaryotes have a single circular strand. So, um, if you were to refer to one of the textbooks or even both the textbooks, you might find uh, there are graphics that show you the single circular strand, it is a very, very long strand. It is not just a very short strand. It is an extremely long strand which has a lot of information encoded in it, but it is a single circular strand. So, we can represent it by a simple circle. So, that is our uh, single chromosome in a prokaryote. On the other hand, eukaryotes all have linear DNA. They do not have circular chromosomes. There are a few exceptions in the literature where people have reported bacteria with linear DNA, but by and large, all prokaryotes have circular stranded DNA. All right, so um, here we have in this particular graph, we have um, a comparison of the genome sizes of archaea bacteria and bacteria. Now, as I said, archaeobacteria go back to a much more primitive form of life and you can see that the genome size on an average is much smaller for archaeobacteria compared to 
bacteria. So you can see all these extremophiles that we were looking at earlier, the methanogenic uh, bacteria, halo bacteria that grow in salt pans, uh, all of uh, the hyperthermophilic bacteria, all these bacteria have a size range anywhere from 0 0.5 million base pairs to about little less than 6 million base pairs. In comparison, if you look at the more modern bacteria, you can see they range from almost the same uh, minimum 0 0.5 million base pairs, but the largest ones are close to 10 million base pairs. And the ones that we are most familiar with in our environment, E. coli, which is one of them, 5.5, it's close to the largest archaeobacteria. Uh, Pseudomonas, which is another very common species found in our environment, uh, Pseudomonas putida, Mycobacterium tuberculosis, all of these are fairly large in general compared to archaeobacteria. Now that we have uh, seen uh, the genome sizes of uh, archaeobacteria as well as bacteria, let's get some idea in terms of other organisms. So, in this table, there are uh, genome sizes for organisms starting all the way from the coronavirus to human beings. So, when we look at human beings, we have a genome size of 3.1 billion base pairs and estimated number of genes is 30,000 to 40,000. A lab mouse would have 1.3 billion base pairs and genes would be around 30,000. Mustard weed uh, has about 60 million base pairs and 25,000 genes. Roundworms have about 48.5 million base pairs and 19,000 genes. So the fruit fly has about 70 million base pairs. Yeast, uh, which is a microorganism, has 12.1 million base pairs and 6,000 genes. E. coli, which is a bacteria, has 4.6 million base pairs and 3,200 genes. Uh, let's compare that with two retroviruses, the human uh, uh, immunodeficiency virus HIV and the coronavirus. The human deficiency virus HIV virus has 9400 bases, not base pairs but bases and 9 genes. Coronavirus which is a single stranded RNA, that's why it cannot be expressed as base pairs, it has to be expressed only in terms of bases has 29,811 bases. Uh, this information was from uh, Nature, the magazine. So in this slide, what you see is more of the same comparison, but this is shown in graphic form. So you can see different types of uh, gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria in terms of base pairs. The size of the genome is anywhere from 10 to the power 6 to 10 to the power 7 base pairs. And fungi, fungi range from 10 to the power 7 to 10 to the power 8, so do algal cells and so do some worms. Crustaceans, uh, echinoderms, insects, all of them range over uh, a fairly large um, size from 10 to the power 8 to 10 to the power uh, 9 or even 10 and birds are around 10 to the power 9, fish are around 10 to the power 9 to 10 to the power 10, reptiles again in the same range, uh, mammals within that range, amphibians, flowering plants, all of them have a huge range from 10 to the power 8 to 10 to the power 11 base pairs. We'll stop at this point. Thank you.